Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Santita Jackson Show, the second hour here on AM 950 Radio, the voice of Progressive Minnesota, and on the Santita Jackson Show YouTube channel. It's a joy to be with you today. I want you to meet my morning stars here on the Santita Jackson Show YouTube channel. Click a like and subscribe, and then touch that button, touch that bell, so that whenever we come up live, you will be notified. And if you will, please meet me on X at Santita J, at Santita J, and at Santita J Show, and of course, on Santita Jackson and Friends, Santita Jackson and Friends on Facebook. What in the world is happening with TikTok? 170 million Americans want to know of all ages. Look, 18 to 29 year olds, the plurality of them are getting about a third of Americans. That is where they go to get their news. Uh, More and more studies are showing that fewer and fewer Americans of every age have much investment in corporate media. They are looking and they're saying, I don't trust you and I'm looking for alternative news sources. That is happening. And so it is in this context that we're looking, we're all searching. And so TikTok in one minute, two minutes, they give us stories and they give us a narrative that maybe we haven't seen before. And some people have said that that has swayed the narrative for October 7th, that tragedy that happened in Israel. Um, And indeed, it's caught everybody by their unawares. Who would have thought you would have had 300,000 and 400,000 people marching in Washington, D.C., looking looking for justice for the Palestinians? Forty years ago, you couldn't even say Palestinian. That's changed. Uh, Who would think that you would have Jewish Voice for Peace locked down Grand Central Station in New York City? Well, that's happening. And they're doing it over these platforms. And many are saying that, oh, TikTok, they uh, we're being subjected to Chinese propaganda. But then when you see an icon like Norman Solomon, someone who's a reasonable, reasonable person who says at the beginning of a war where he foresaw what we have now seen to be hundreds of thousands of casualties, deaths, he said, before this even begins, let us have peace. Let's have peace talks. Well, for his trouble on Facebook, as soon as he did that, what happened? He was banned for two weeks. So who's controlling the narrative, really? Let's talk about that. And why, oh, why, oh, why has TikTok been targeted? Jonathan Greenblatt, from the the head of the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, in uh, in a leaked conversation, said to other leaders in the Jewish community, he said, look, we are losing this narrative on October 7th. And you keep thinking that it's a Democratic problem, it's a Republican problem, it's a problem of the right or the left. No, it's a TikTok problem. You see, we've lost the young people on this one, and that's the problem. And then not too long after that, even though people have been worried about TikTok, for the past few years, you've seen stories percolating about that. You know, TikTok is reshaping the narrative the predominating narratives. Well, now we're seeing the U.S. House of Representatives overwhelmingly vote to ban TikTok. How will that work? And then you have 10, 11, and 12-year-olds calling their congressperson's office or their parents' congressperson's office saying, hey, don't ban my TikTok. Wow. We got a lot to talk about today. How did we get here? What is going on? We have got Richie Serjenko from Roots Action, of course, Jeff Cohen and Norman Solomon, our dear, dear friends have been working with him since I was working with them since I was a child. But we're going to start with you, Seth Stern, Director of Advocacy for the Freedom of the Press Foundation. What is going on? Well, you raised some good questions about what the real reason is why Congress is coming after TikTok. But even if we take them at their word, the proposed ban is really problematic and unprecedented. Even if we take them at their word that China is using TikTok to surveil and and propagandize um, Americans and that that poses some sort of national security threat. You know, nobody can point to any hard evidence that that's happening, let alone that whatever threat it poses is severe and urgent enough to justify censorship. You know, we had the Pentagon Papers case a long time ago in the early 70s, 
And the Supreme Court there said pretty clearly, you can't just wave the words national security around as if they're these, you know, this magic phrase that, that, that does away with the First Amendment and does away with press freedom and does away with speech freedom. If you want to censor even a single article, a prior restraint it's called in the United States, the law at least is, or we thought it was, you need to prove um, that something terrible is going to happen and it's going to happen immediately. And this is the only way to stop it. And we've exhausted every alternative and that's it. And no case has ever actually risen to that standard because that, that's not how it works. That's out of Hollywood. And that's when we're talking about censoring one article you know, the publication of the Pentagon Papers. Mm -hmm. Here we're talking about an entire social media platform that thousands of people use to communicate, thousands of journalists use to reach their audience and to find stories, to find sources. Um, you know, it's like the idea that if a bookstore carried one book that qualified as illegal for some reason, obscenity, whatever it may be, that you could just shut down the entire bookstore, that you could shut down say that the Pentagon Papers had been successfully centered, that you could shut down the New York Times over over that one article. I mean, it's absurd. And when you start thinking of analogies outside of the digital context, when you start thinking about this, what's the equivalent in, in a print media sense, when a newspaper, a bookstore, it really illustrates how absurd and unprecedented the idea is that just because there is some alleged vague nebulous threat of some national security concern that no one can even really clearly articulate and that officials really admit is hypothetical, that just because of that, we can shut down an entire platform that, as you say, has become a, a critical part, and some can say for better, some can say for worse, but a critical part of shaping the national discourse. It's really concerning. Well, Seth Stern, what are we looking at? I mean, if it is shut down, how does that work? And what does that say about America in 2024? What I mean, who 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 died and left someone God and determined <laughs> who owns these platforms? I mean, I'm just trying to figure out how that works. Well, right. Um, the 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 way that the bill that was passed by the House would effectuate the ban is by uh, requiring uh, ByteDance, the, the the company that owns TikTok, to to sell it to a presidentially approved um, buyer within six months. And people have raised concerns over whether that's even possible, whether the transaction could be completed in that time frame. But putting that aside, and again, trying to get back to a non-digital analogy, because even decades into the internet, it, it still throws people for a loop and people think different rules apply. But imagine the US Congress attempted to force the Guardian or Al Jazeera or Der Spiegel to, to sell itself to a presidentially approved buyer in order to be read in the United States. Um, that's, that's, that's wild, that's, that's really hard to imagine. And um, this is one of many actions when it comes to press freedom and the First Amendment that just undermines our global standing. You know, who are we to tell China anymore that they can't ban our platforms, um, our media, there, who are who are we to speak up against censorship in other countries when we are doing this ourselves? Um, you know, where we, we've got the prosecution of Julian Assange, we're shutting down social media platforms, we're doing nothing to put pressure on the Israeli government to allow journalists into Gaza and also to, you know, for for, for Israel to, to to not kill them once they're there. Um, we're entirely eroding our standing, assuming we had it at, at some point as a global lead leader on speech and press freedom. Richie Serzhenko, Roots Action. You know, there's always a story behind the story. What is it? Because now a lot has been, a lot has been percolating for a couple of years about the proposed ban of TikTok. But now, it has at least stage one has happened. The House voted to ban TikTok. I don't know what that's going to mean, what it's going to look like, but what's the story behind the story? Who yeah, I mean, would... yeah, I, I think that the Israel lobby has has attempted to not be too public facing about 
uh, intentionally going after TikTok, but like you uh, said earlier about Jonathan Greenblatt from the ADL with the leaked recording saying we have a major TikTok problem, a Gen Z problem. Um, and then if you look at who the number one contributor to the TikTok ban bill, uh, Mike uh, Gallagher, it's APAC. Um, and so although they aren't uh, publicly lobbying or pu putting it out there that they are lobbying against the TikTok bill, there's obviously, um, given what has transpired over the past few months about swaying public opinion, the Israel lobby, of course, wants to shut down TikTok, um, especially um, because, you know, you see APAC putting out things with a talking points memo saying that um, that children in Gaza aren't actually starving. They put out these talking points and we're seeing that young people aren't buying their BS. And part of it is because, you know, a decent amount of young people are getting their news from TikTok. And so, yeah, they, we have a generation of people that are seeing through the BS. Um, and yeah, the Israel lobby, of course, would love to shut down TikTok. Or of course they would love to shut down TikTok and then get it sold to uh, uh, Steve Munchen, um, who is a pro-Israel uh, uh, billionaire. And because as Seth said earlier that, you know, it wouldn't just be a ban, it would be forcing the sale of TikTok. Um, and who has come out in major support of this? We have pro-Israel Steve Munchen. So um, I think that there is that whole story wrapped up um, behind it all that really hasn't been um, exposed much. Is this also, um, well, certainly you could understand Steve Mnuchin's point. I don't agree with it, but I get it. It seems like there's a push to censor just overall. And um, I think Americans are beginning to catch on to it, you know, because that's why the corporate media is something that people are beginning to push back on. I mean, there's a reason that TikTok and these independent news sources um, and different theories, I'm not going to call them conspiracy theories because that comes from the CIA and I don't want to, I, I just I think it's insulting. But just because I depart from the dominant narrative, I must be crazy. I don't think that's fair. But I, what, but what is this movement to censor the press? I mean, they're the only protected class in our constitution. I mean, first of all, let me start with you, Seth. What is the importance of having a free, unfettered press? How does that help to preserve the republic? How does that further democracy? Well, the more information channels that we can have, the more options people can have for where to get their information, the more voices that they're exposed to, the better equipped they are to make decisions, to hold power accountable, um, to participate in our democracy and feel good about doing it, feel that they that, that they have some knowledge and understanding of, of why they're, 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 they're participating in our democracy and what they hope to achieve. Um, without a free press, what you're left with is propaganda. You have the government controlling the narrative or in our era, corporate interests controlling the narrative. Um, nowadays, we've got a situation where the press is in um, a state of evolution, the business model for the media that worked for some time is no longer working for a combination of reasons. But just the fact of the matter is that newsrooms left and right are shuttering and that affects both local news at, at, at the state municipal level and um, investigative journalism on, on, on matters of war and peace and national security. They don't have the budgets they used to. Um, so when we talk about press freedom, and we're talking about organizations like the New York Times or, or, or the Washington Post. Sure, we want them to have their freedom and, 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 and they're important, but they're facing financial challenges in, a, in addition to journalistic challenges. They can't do the work that they used to do. Other avenues need to, need to step up. And social media is where a lot of those avenues get their start and where they're able to promote their work. And you've got you know, Facebook saying that it's pulling back from news. It doesn't want to be a distributor of news. So again, if TikTok's gone, Facebook's not a viable outlet for news. 
Um, there are limited places for journalists to go these days when they can't get their foot in the door in traditional outlets and social media is shutting them out um, as well, both in Facebook's case for, 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 for business reasons and then in TikTok's case, potentially, you know, forced by forced by the U.S. government. So um, a free press is is great, but we need the free press to exist, not just as a matter of academic and legal theory. We need it to exist Practically speaking, there need to be channels available for journalists to report and for readers to read them. And these days, TikTok is 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 a major um, one of those, shutting it down um, precisely because it is persuasive and powerful, and people read it is really concerning. You know, you don't lose your freedom of speech just because your speech is effective. Mm -hmm. uh, Reverend Dr. Yuri. I think of Darnella Frazier, uh, the young 17-year-old girl who was with her nine-year-old cousin, just going to the corner store. And she sees some fellow she doesn't know, but turns out it was George Floyd. And she pulls out her phone. She tells her, her cousin, go in the store, nine years of age. I don't want you to see what I think you're going to see. My life experience says that this is going to be bad. At the tender age of 17, she knew this. When you begin to shut down avenues where we can get the story out, what does that do to us? I mean, what does, I mean, then take that into the TikTok ban and, and the fact that there's some things that you can, you know, you get squeezed out algorithmically on, on Facebook. That's what happened to Norman Solomon. He was just shut down for two weeks talking about peace. <laughs> I mean, what does, what is it? First of all, what does a Facebook ban mean to you? And what do you think is going to be to these, these young people who you shepherd in, in your church? Well, I mean, the, the potential for a TikTok ban uh, simply just creates uh, the mechanism by which you find another platform, right? That's one. Uh, those who have been in oppressed communities have always found themselves subject to the manipulation of information channels. Because at the end of the day, the first rule of warfare is to establish some sort of propaganda so you can frame what is actually taking place. We see it actually happening in Gaza right now. On one hand, it's supposed to be uh, a significant effort for uh, a response to an unlawful act. And now it's become far beyond retribution and even extending beyond, uh, let's just call it colonization. Uh, at, 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 the, at the hands of, of, of war and retribution. So when we start talking about the mechanisms by which folks in the community are able to communicate, are able to get the story out beyond the manipulation and the reach of the state, right? Not just the government, we talk about the state rich lar writ large as a sovereign. Uh, what that means then is that the state has to then hold itself accountable in terms of how it engages because it cannot manipulate the messaging. And many times we've seen, even before uh, the current dust up about TikTok, and we saw uh, what social media allowed uh, in the tragic killing of George Floyd in the middle of the street, but even in Baltimore, Maryland, where uh, a lot of just kind of regular everyday media people, reporters on the street, they call people, were capturing what was going on at the hands of the Baltimore City Police Department. And now you look up and you have a consent decree that is forcing significant oversight and, and reforms inside the department about constitutional policing. And so what we have to be careful and wary of is that whenever the government starts determining where the voices of the people can be heard and expressed. There's usually a problem in there somewhere. And the problem is there's something in, in, the, in what's purported to be some national security concern about who the owners are of the platform, uh, as opposed to putting in regulation, they pass legislation that says you must sell the platform. And if you sell the platform, what do we want? We want the users of the platform, because if we can control who has access to those users, we have control over the message that goes out to them. And not just in terms of what's happening in, in the international space, but more importantly, what's happening in the lives of the folks at home controlled by the government, 
their own government. And so if there's, if there's domestic freedom, if there's domestic capacity to be able to have autonomy and agency about how you communicate, then that becomes a problem when you live in the age where government manipulation and oppression is the rule. It's not the exception anymore. And so that's that's the backstory for folks who who've seen this movie before in the forms of COINTELPRO and other mechanisms like that during periods of resistance. This move on TikTok, while it is guised as um, or disguised as uh, a, a protection of national security, what it really is, is trying to protect the reputational harm that can come from the truth if it gets out on the platform that the government cannot control. Mm, and we have been joined by our dear friend, Seth Stern and Ricky Sergenko and uh, Reverend Dr. Todd Geary, the policy director for Defending Rights and Dissent. The last time I spoke with you a few weeks ago, you had just left the courtroom with Julian Assange. If you can tell us how he's doing before we ask you about the TikTok ban, it would help a lot. I certainly want to bring you back on the show to talk about him because so much of this is about him. Well, we're, we're still waiting for the British High Court to determine whether or not Julian Assange will have a right to appeal. Uh, as, as you mentioned, as I mentioned on the last time I was here, uh, Julian Assange was not in court that day because he was mm -hmm. too sick. He had broken a rib. You asked how he broke his rib. I actually now know the answer. He broke his rib through excessive coughing. Mm. Um, so he's in really bad health and really bad shape. And we are hoping as we come to the five year anniversary of his imprisonment in Belmarsh that we will finally see some justice for, for Julian Assange. In the last month alone, two separate United Nations special rapporteurs, the rapporteur on torture and free expression have called for his extradition to be blocked. So there is a growing international consensus that this cannot be allowed to go through. And I hope our government and the British governments come to their senses and uphold the principles they say they believe in and stop this persecution of Julian Assange. Which leads us to the TikTok ban. What do you think of it? What does it mean? I mean, is this really censorship, uh, an attempt at censorship at large? I mean, will the press be protected through all of this? I'm throwing a lot at you, but there's a lot here. What? Yeah, give me a minute. My connection seems to be not great. Oh, I'm gonna okay. I'll be right back. I got to switch okay. my... Not a problem. Well, you know, let me just say, we'll wait for him to come back. I think my concern is censorship and how dare you just decide to take someone's property and give it to someone else. There's something about that that just... That's, called, Amer that's, that's, that's called America. Okay, it's gangsterism at its finest, but gee whiz. Let me let me get let me bring on okay. Are we now I'm here that? twice? I don't know why I'm here twice, don't, but my don't even worry about it. My a, connection is better. This happened to Seth and I last week. He knows all too it. well that my computer connection is bad when I switch what Wi Fi I'm using, and I'm here twice. Um, it's okay. so no, I, I, got could, you I, I couldn't that. hear the question. Well, my okay. question What's, is, what was what? Let me let me simplify it. What do you make of the TikTok man? Particularly so, and, and contextualize it with what's happening with Julian Assange, if you will, because we're looking at censorship. All Julian Assange and WikiLeaks did was tell us the truth. They did well, reshape the narrative, right? The, the, the TikTok ban has been something people have been talking about for several years now. The reason they usually give is that the Chinese government will have all this access to Americans' data. Uh, every single civil liberties organization, including myself, has always responded with, well, let's pass comprehensive privacy restrictions. So Facebook doesn't have that access. So Twitter doesn't have that access. And then the question always comes up is, why do we single out TikTok? I've had a number of discussions on the Hill. I'm not going to say with who about this TikTok ban. Every single person I have spoken to on the Hill has told me the push to block TikTok at this current time is about the Gaza war. 
like, like zero, like it's a lot of factors. Cause when I talk about it, I always say there's a number of factors. There's a pre-existing drive to get rid of TikTok. Some of this is this sort of new cold war drive with China. Some of this is fear of competitors for your social media. No. Some of this is this sort of one-sided concern with privacy. But you cannot, I, I would never deny that in the last couple months, people who support Israel's genocide in Gaza and are upset that they don't have majority support for their position have increasingly been singling out TikTok. And I have spoken to multiple people on the Hill in the last week. Everyone has, has pinpointed that, that it is about controlling the narrative. They've gone much further than I would, would go talking to you. Um, and I think it's really troubling because we have seen this history before. I mean, you can go back. They said the civil rights movement was because of communists, right? Not because mm -hmm. black people want to be free, but because the communists were putting all this propaganda out. You can go back and they'll say, oh, why do people care about the Vietnam War? Must be the Soviet Union. Why do people care about Nelson Mandela? Must be the Soviet Union. Uh, why are you know even in the in the red summer in, in the 1920s where you saw horrible race, racist violence against african americans in dc in chicago you know hoover and people were investigating whether the soviets and the industrial workers of the world the anarchist union the wobblies that sounds so passe to even bring up were somehow behind it so there is this old narrative that when people in this country don't think what the government wants them to think it must be the work of some sort of sinister domestic force or foreign influence it can never be that people have eyes and they're looking at hospitals being attacked in Gaza. They're looking at children dying in Gaza. They're looking at spending money on the Vietnam War when we don't have, uh, you know, health care or jobs in this country. They're sick of sitting at segregated lunch counters or in segregated buses. It can only be the mean Chinese or the mean Russians have tricked us into thinking this. So there is a really dark history that is being tapped into. This sort of old school Cold War narrative that domestic dissent is being manipulated or the product of foreign influence as well as this inability to accept that people have good faith concerns about what is happening in Gaza right now. Well, given what you're hearing on the Hill, I'm hearing it in Washington also. We're all, yeah, no, yeah. We're all, we're all hearing it in Washington. I mean, does, does Steve Mnuchin and his ilk, do they not understand, and I'm gonna kick this to you and give it to the rest of the panel, do they not, do they not know that people are having this discussion, that, that's the quiet part on the Hill, but it's now being said out loud. And that's harmful to, I mean, you know, when as we're watching, as we're, look, and anti-everybody is spiking, anti-Semitism against Jewish people, against Arabs, anti-Black sentiments, all, everything's spiking. I mean, do they not know that, I mean, is anyone not speaking to um, to a Steve Mnuchin and to Jonathan Goldblatt and others and say, hey, you, you're reaching too far. This this hubris, that people now think that you are trying to control everything. This is going to hurt you. Chip Gibbons. Yeah, I mean, I don't think people in Washington understand hubris. I mean, you mentioned the Assange case earlier. I mean, all over the world, we have allies and adversaries alike citing this as an example of a human rights abuse, including people we depend on for, you know, a lot of military things I don't think we should be doing. And we have no concern for their opinions. So I, I don't think people in Washington understand the concept of, of hubris. I, I wish they did because, you know, their foolishness gets the rest of us hurt. Um, but I don't I don't think hubris is, is a concept we, we do in Washington. Well, I mean, Seth, what gives? You, I think that you're right, hubris, because we are so guilty of overreach all the time. I mean, it is concerning that, um, you know, in, in a revolution, the first system you see is, of course, is a communication system, right? I mean, so it's like, what are we living in the midst of, Seth? Yeah, and, and the efforts to ban TikTok 
um, although they might have been revived by the war in Gaza, they predate the war in Gaza. There were similar bills um, last year. And, you know, Trump tried to ban TikTok. Um, the state of Montana banned TikTok and was overruled by the courts. So this isn't um, a new thing. It's just sort of the latest reason to um, to revive it. And, um, you know, there's part of it is it, it is just straight up xenophobia, I think, a, a Chinese app doing the exact same things that U.S. apps do every day. Um, and that even if the Chinese government wanted to do, they could do through U.S. apps. Um, there, there, there's no reason that China needs TikTok in particular to surveil Americans if that is what it's intent to do or to propagandize Americans if that's what it's intent to do. So the, 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 the reasons for it really have never um, made any sense, but it's something that's been um, going on for, for some time. And um, my fear, as bad as it would be to ban TikTok, that is just the first stone, you know, that, that, that's just the first step. The logic being used to ban TikTok could be used to ban Al Jazeera, to ban um, RT, to ban any number of foreign outlets that one day might become adversarial to the United States. And even if you look at the definition of the kind of application that can be banned that's included in the current bill, it's not necessarily limited to social media apps. It could easily be used against any uh, news outlet that enables, you know, online commenting, for example. Mm -hmm. So there are really some dark directions that we can go if we continue um, down this road. And when you talk about Mnuchin, his comment was something like, well, China would never allow a U.S. app to, 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 to do this there. Um, so that's that's what we're doing. We are we, we are. Um, calling the Chinese, you know, these the, the, these authoritarians and this, you know, evil uh, foreign force. And then we're saying, well, we're going to stoop to their level. If they won't allow our media, we're not going to allow their medias. We're, we're, we're racing to we're racing to the bottom, essentially. And where does that lead us? Because if you look at the actual bottom, if you look at how bad censorship can get, um, we've got a long way to go. But we're, we're setting up the legal mechanisms to get there. Well, you know, I guess I've just, we've been seeing this in the civil rights movement ever since, ever since. I just think the broader community is getting a taste of it and it does not taste good. I mean, the FBI, if you want freedom, you're a communist. You must want to be with Khrushchev. <laughs> I mean, clearly there's something wrong with you. And that sounds odd that every time I push for freedom, you align me with our, with our alleged enemies. Something about that just, before I get back to you, Richie, uh, something about that is, is, is really odd. I mean, so, I mean, where, where do we go from here? I mean, what do we do? Because you had children, if, if that is to be believed, who were calling uh, Congress last week, Chip. They were saying, don't take my TikTok for me. I mean, and I think that's going to shape them and their thinking, too. Absolutely. Censorship completely defines people's worldview. You know, I, I came of age during the Iraq war and I distinctively remember when I was in high school, I tried to organize a talk for Iraq war veterans who were against the war after school at my school through a club for students who wanted to come. And there was a massive, massive, massive effort to shut us down. And if you're wondering why I'm so concerned with WikiLeaks being prosecuted for exposing war crimes. Why? Well, I don't know how many years ago that was. I'm not good at math. Uh, I think it was 20, actually. Gosh, that's a long time. Uh, you know, it's because I had that experience. And I also mm -hmm. got involved in Palestinian solidarity work very early on in, in life. And I've seen the way in which Palestinian voices, supporters of Palestine were censored in a way that I would not censor people who I think are, are advocating for war crimes, right? I would never engage in that type of censorship, but it certainly turned me against censorship. It made me very skeptical of conventional media and it made me very skeptical of the government. So if you have young people who like TikTok, and 
I can't stand social media, so I cannot understand why anyone wants to be on TikTok, but, but people do. People do. We'll, we'll let them do it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and they're going to lose that. And they're hearing it's because they have the wrong views on a genocide. And Seth is 100% right. This did not start with October the 7th. And there were pre-existing drives. And I did not mean to imply that was the sole reason. But that has been a big part of the debate behind the door this time. Uh, they're going to have a lifelong hostility and skepticism towards our government. And they're going to not view us as a pluralistic democratic society, but a society in which state and corporate power conspire together in order to silence people's political views who are speaking up for causes they believe to be just. And that's going to have horrible impact. You know, there was a lot of panic a few years back about Russian media, and I am zero fan of RT or Sputnik. But when I first moved to DC in 2013, they had these huge billboards all around DC. One had Colin Powell holding up the evidence, evidence in quotations, at the UN Security Council of Iraq weapons of mass destruction. We know there wasn't any. And the other was George W. Bush on that aircraft carrier with mission accomplished behind him saying, don't you think you need a second opinion? If <laughs> really concerned about Russian propaganda, if people are really concerned about Chinese propaganda, if they're really concerned about conspiracy theories on the internet, and there are a lot of really crazy conspiracy theories on the internet, I'm concerned too, they should stop lying, stop engaging in propaganda. Because when you have the president, as I watched, say there are weapons of mass destruction when there aren't any, say there's a connection on when there aren't any, and all of the media parrots it and says, if you don't agree with us, you're a terrorist, you're a Saddam lover, you're a this, they're going to be skeptical of those sources, and they're going to turn to things that are, in fact, conspiracy theories. We create the market that allows these sorts of unhelpful theories to proliferate when we lie and propagandize. Well, you know, I, and again, the quiet part is being said out loud, Ricky, I mean, Richie. I mean, it's what people would not dare say um, publicly. The whisper is, it's real loud. It's real loud now. So, I mean, who is Mike Gallagher? Uh, and why was he pushing so hard for this ban? Uh, so Mike Gallagher is the uh, Congress member from Wisconsin. Uh, he, he is the author of this bill. Um, you know, I can't say exactly what his reasons were for, for, you know, writing this bill. I do know that post October 7th, he said, you know, uh, you know, it's our duty to, to uh, defend Israel. Um, post October 7th, Gallagher said TikTok was like digital fentanyl. He said it was brainwashing American youth, youth against Israel, Jews in the West. And that aligned with what Jonathan Greenblatt was saying with for the ADL, that, that we have a Gen Z problem, that we have a TikTok problem. But I do want to point out like a very interesting thing that Chip had mentioned about, you know, the collaboration of um, corporate entities in the state and how the youth are using TikTok to spread information. You know, this comes at a time where we're seeing in, in Atlanta, they're attempting to build a 300 acre uh, police training facility called mm -hmm. Cop City. Um, and in order to do so, they killed an activist named Tortuguita. They are charging 61 people uh, under the RICO statute. They are attempting to uh, label people domestic terror terrorists. And TikTok is used to spread information like that. And so we are seeing this like um, kind of formation happening that I, I think that we can all see um, where the state and corporate entities are moving in a certain direction as if they're preparing for something to, for, you know, something bigger to happen. Um, not to mention that, um, the Israeli Defense Forces would train in Atlanta at the Cop City facility. Um, and that's not directly related to the TikTok ban, but 
I wanted to frame that in an over, a bigger overall picture for us to understand what is coming down the line. Uh, Seth mentioned previously with um, news media and, and different publications shutting down, it's becoming harder for journalists to get the word out. Just exactly what is happening under our quote unquote democracy. I mean, and that's, that's which loops us back to Julian Assange. That's what's happening. <laughs> I mean, so where do we go from here, Chip? I know you can't stay with us much longer, but I'd like for you to help us to understand what it is. What do you foresee? What do you see the Senate doing? I mean, is this going to be too hot to touch? Because now, since the ban has been passed in the U.S. House of Representatives, now, yet again, the conversation has changed. Because people are now asking why. Now you see openly online people saying, okay, this is Jonathan Greenblatt. This is Steve Mnuchin. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is APAC. This is ADL. Now you've got that conversation going. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's it's a lot of people. It, it, the, the sort of pro-Israel folks are sort of the, the latest group to, to join on. I don't think you can exclusively blame them. There are other It's so many here. people. I mean, it is. It, it's it's the Cold War people. It's the tech companies who don't want to compete. And then you know they've been whatever Montana was doing. It's been all that. And then at sort of the last moment, uh, the pro-Israel forces jump in. And and I think I don't know if they got it over the line, but that certainly is the perception. Um, I think there's been a lot of backlash to to passing this TikTok ban. I've seen. I know, you know, Seth can attest to this. All of the press freedom, all of the civil liberties groups have spoken out against it. I think a lot of young people are very upset about it. I would hope people in the Senate would pause for a minute and think about why there's all this backlash. But I, I don't I don't want to make a prediction here because there's been times where I thought we were going to win and we've lost. And there's been times where I thought we really were defeated and we came through. So um I mean, if you're concerned with the TikTok ban, you should call your senator and tell them. If you're concerned about Julian Assange, you should call your senator and tell them, right? They should hear from you that you value freedom of expression. I, I do think if this bill goes through, it, it has, as Seth was pointing out, it's a very broad bill. It can be used to ban more things than just TikTok. I don't know how the president will, will use it. And, you know, it isn't just President Biden, it's President Trump. There has been a lot of efforts since the Iraq war, since on 11, to put pressure on Al Jazeera. Uh, Al Jazeera cameramen were, were bombed by the U.S. during the Iraq war. They're being bombed by Israel in this war. They arrested an Al Jazeera journalist this morning. Uh, there have been huge pressures to make Al Jazeera register as a foreign agent of Qatar. So this really could blow back into shutting down even more mainstream media. Uh, that's a worst case scenario. That doesn't mean it's going to happen. But there is ample reason to be concerned with this bill. Hmm. What's your final word before you go? I, I mean, I think, again, if you don't want people to be propagandized, don't engage in propaganda. When you knowingly lie about foreign policy or anything else, people won't believe you and they will believe your ad adversaries. These are self-inflicted wounds when it comes to fake news and disinformation. Chip Gibbons, Policy Director for Defending Rights and Dissent. I've got to have you back so we can talk uh, more extensively about Julian Assange because I'm very concerned about him. To me, he is like one of the logical conclusions of this. Yeah, <laughs> it's, dark. it's dark. Yeah, it is dark. But, you know, in the darkness, all it takes is one candle, just a little bit of light, and it'll, it'll guide you toward the light. And so uh, if you are in touch with this family, certainly give his regards to, uh, give our regards to him and to his family. Reverend Jesse Jackson visited him in London in the Ecuadorian embassy some years ago when he was still doing that. And they that. remember that. That hasn't yeah. been forgotten. That has no one, no one has forgotten that. Well, That's you know, his heart is still with them. And That's so please serious. let them know that. Please let them know. Blessings to you, Chip Gibbons, Policy Director for Defending Rights and Dissent. Seth, I mean, it seems that we do need our rights and the right to dissent defended more than ever. I mean, and this is this is a very interesting period. I mean, before I pivot to you, Reverend Dr. Yuri, coming out of the civil rights movement. Well, well, hold on, Seth. Coming out of the civil rights movement, this is not something that is shocking to us. 
it, it's shocking to people to whom this has not happened, Richie and Seth. It's like, this doesn't happen to us. Dr. King, you, I, I think we're several generations ahead of you <laughs> because, you know, coming out of the civil rights movement, uh, when the FBI had a top, top 10 television show, we knew who uh, J. Edgar Hoover was. Uh, we knew that the Black Panther story was a lie, the first telling of it. Oh, they were engaged in a shootout. Mark Clark and 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 Fred Hampton, who had his eight and a half month pregnant fiance asleep in the back. No, they were not engaged in a shootout. But thank God that his attorney went to the apartment the next day, and saw that all the bullet holes went into the building. And, and when you don't have someone to tell your story, um, Reverend Yeary, that is a very dangerous thing. I mean, now people feel empowered to pull out their phones and 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 to and, and to say something. If you take that away, where does that energy go? It's energy. It's it's got to go somewhere, Reverend Doctor Ewing. Well, it's 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 always going to go somewhere. Um, messages give meaning. Messages also help to give motivation. Uh, motivation for, for organizing, galvanizing, strategically planning, forming alliances, um, building coalition. And so all you need do is look at the demographic breakdown of where TikTok's penetration is in this time where there's a shift in terms of which demographic is becoming the, the majority demographic in terms of uh, the politics of the country. And of course, you would recognize that the first thing you want to do is to disrupt the ability to build cohesion, the ability of, for folks to be able to not only build cohesion here, it's not just what's going on here, but how many TikTok users are there across the planet? Once upon a time, we used to have pen pals. We had to sit down and actually use these things called pen and paper to write notes. And we would have to go to the, go get a stamp and go to this arcane museum now called a post office to be able to send a note to somebody on the other side of the world. We can have conversations in real time now. Mm -hmm. We can communicate in real time now. We can understand context in real time now. And so the connectedness of what's happening globally undermines and undercuts the ability for domination globally. This whole notion of trying to limit the, the, the agency of people through controlling messaging and controlling access to messaging. First of all, it's, it's not going to work. I don't, even if you sell TikTok to Mnuchin, Right, it's like selling Twitter to to Elon Musk. Right, X is nowhere close to what it once was. Um, and, uh oh, the 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 gr the, gr the, gr the gremlins have shown up. Okay, try. <laughs> is that? Oh, nothing, guys. Really, come on, stop it. Is that, is that, is was that, did, did, did I say something wrong? Oh, the villains are with you, but that's, that, that's all right. Um, as they say in the book, black church, the devil is a liar. We rebuke you in the name. Jesus. Yeah, there, yeah, there's, 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 there's some rebuking going on. So, I'm just so we'll, 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 we'll figure it out. The last word, the is unbelievable. Oh. Richie Sajinko, the final word. You've got a couple of minutes here. Um, I would just say, what? yeah, this. Are all gremlins here? Are you serious right now, you guys? Uh, is it tough to hear me as well? Oh, okay. no. Okay, well, Seth, let me try you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I, I, I got to hear Richie and Seth. And I can hear you, Doctor. Oh, wow. I, I think it's 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 just. Let, uh, me, let me try this. Okay, mute, unmute, and let me just do. Okay, unmute. Reverend Doctor Yuri. I'm good. Okay, now you, there you go, Reverend Doctor Yuri. One minute for you. Well, no, I I really want to hear from from Richie and Seth because this this is a okay. moment where the where where the this generation is very uh, ingenious in, in being able to build a workaround. So I wanna hear the workaround. What happens if there's a hijacking of TikTok? 
how do you make sure that you keep the momentum and the connectedness amongst these conversations where we don't become so platform dependent that it's easier to manipulate and control? Okay, starting with you, Richie. Yeah, I would just say from, you know, an organizing perspective in general, you need to know the people in your neighborhood. You need to organize your neighborhood. You need to organize your household. You need to organize your workplace. Um, so, yeah, it's, a, you know, TikTok and all of these social media platforms are a very valuable tool for organizing. Um, but the, the work doesn't stop, you know, if TikTok were to go down. Um, but... I would say, um, yeah, my my final word would just be the unfolding of these events um, happening under a Biden presidency. I think it's a perfect example of how neoliberalism is leading the way into this new wave of fascism. Um, and with what's happening in Atlanta with Cop City protesters, um, with ha what's happening with mainstream media, with publications going down, journalists losing their jobs, and trying to take away the TikTok platform. Um, I believe that capitalism is crumbling in front of our eyes um, and that um, the state is also preparing for that. Mm. Seth, the last minute and a half belong to you. Thank you. Well, I think when we talk about these kids who have never called their Congress people before in many instances, um, activating attempting to push back against the TikTok ban. My hope is that um, a new generation is learning to appreciate the freedom of the press, the freedom of, the, of, of speech, the need for those, for, for those rights that perhaps they took for granted having come up in an age when we were really just marveling at the scale of information sharing that technology allowed. Um, now we're seeing the dark side of that. We're marveling at the scale of censorship that those same technologies allow. Once a platform becomes as large and influential as TikTok is, shutting it down has a, a, a huge you know, impact potentially. And um, people who may have thought there were just infinite ways to communicate, they've grown up with screens in front of their faces all day. Um, now, they're, now they're seeing that that can be taken away from them, in, at least in some meaningful part. Um, so hopefully they aren't going to stand for efforts like this and are going to remain active, even if the Senate doesn't advance this particular bill. Because what we know now, it having come back a second time, is that this will keep coming back around. And they kind of caught us sleeping this time. Nobody really saw the House moving so quickly on this bill. It happened very fast. Um, next time, hopefully people will be expecting it and will be organized and, and ready to fight back, not only against... TikTok bans or social media bans, but on any form of censorship, whether aimed at a, an individual journalist, an individual publisher, an individual speaker, or a platform that reaches millions like TikTok. Amen. And you know, really, our First Amendment right, it is a right, but I tell you what, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. And we do have to be vigilant eternally. And remember, the struggle continues and victory is certain if you continue in the struggle. This American project is something you have to work on and work at every single day. It has continued to expand and include more and more people. I don't care how it started. This is how it's being processed. And it needs you to be involved. You need to be registered to vote. You need to be voting. You need to be involved. This is a tough form of government, everybody. And it's a mature form of government. It requires that you get involved. Otherwise, you can have a monarchy and somebody else do it. Or you can have an oligarchy. We don't want those things. We're dangerously close to having it. But we have the power to turn all turn the tide. We can do it. We can do it. I'm Santita Jackson, Seth Stern, Richie Serjinko, Reverend Dr. Todd Geary, and, oh, my beloved Dr. David Gibbs, who got in so late but he's had COVID. I love you, Dr. Gibbs from the University of Arizona. <laughs> Next time we're gonna get you on a little bit earlier when you're not suffering with COVID. We love you. <laughs> Thank you, Santita. Thanks for- oh, <coughs> Absolutely. Very, uh, um, the, um, my COVID case isn't that bad. <coughs> uh, well, I've never had it before, so it's uh, a new thing for me. Well, I it will pass. 
just just take care of yourself. Sending you much love. Much love to everybody. God bless you. 